so welcome everyone. Um, so I will uh, give you um, a seminar on the how machine learning is used in high energy physics. So I will provide, in fact, uh, two examples of a research use case. Um, so first, maybe before starting, uh, well, I just want to let me, you know, a little bit about myself. So I'm a, a physicist at the Atlas uh, experiment. And I've been working on um, searches for beyond the standard model uh, since uh, a while now. Uh, but in the last, uh, let's say, five uh, or a bit more than five years now, I've switched to more uh, usage of machine learning tools for the search of a new physics. This is, a, of course, as you know, a very important topic at uh, the LHC. And uh, what I, my objective here is to show you uh, um, how uh, the research can be enhanced by applying some uh, of these tools, which uh, are quite advanced, or some of them are uh, also rather uh, very new. Okay, so this is a brief introduction. So yeah, of course, please uh, stop uh, me if you have any question, and I will uh, I will continue. Um, okay, so, uh, well, a, a brief uh, introduction. So I, I'm going to discuss of uh, machine learning, but just to remind you that machine learning is mathematics, statistics, algorithmic, and uh, computing power. The three of uh, those are each uh, related to, uh, I mean, it's important to, to, to be strong in each of these fields. Another point is that, um, High energy physics has been using statistics uh, almost since the beginning because all measurement, physics measurement discoveries relied on statistics. So this is not new, but what is new is that since 10 or 15 years, uh, the machine learning uh, paradigm has shifted uh, quite a lot. Uh, thanks to, uh, I must say, really breakthrough ideas uh, that came not from particular physicists, but mostly by statisticians, computer scientists, and those ideas now have percolated the, uh, in the high energy physics world, and uh, they are part of uh, many researches that are done nowadays. So uh, the message to take home for this introduction is that uh, we are talking about very powerful tools that enable to uh, do physics, uh, uh, but in a better way and also uh, in a new way. So that's what I'm trying to, to uh, this demonstrate in this, uh, demo uh, this uh, presentation. Okay, uh, here is the uh, outline of uh, the seminar. So we'll um, make a brief reminder of what is machine learning and show some example of uh, usage. Uh, then I'll move to uh, the two use cases and example I want to discuss with you today. Uh, first is an internship opportunity that we are offering here in Clermont-Ferrand on jet tagging. So I will briefly introduce that subject. And then I will, uh, so the, the second part will take a bit longer. Uh, I will give you a concrete uh, application uh, in the research for new physics. So this is what we call anomaly detection. So I will show you a proof of concept of a method that have been developed recently by uh, our team and uh, show you uh, what are the interesting points of it. Okay, so a uh, very uh, simple reminder of machine learning. So uh, classical machine learning is basically uh, this function that you see. Can you see my mouse if I move like that? The, yes, yes, yes. Okay, great, thanks. Uh, <clears throat> so X is your data, uh, your model is, is Y, and the parameter of your model are W, and what you want to achieve is a given target uh, that we call T here. Uh, so that's not new. Uh, machine learning has uh, been in a, uh, in a scenery for a long time. Uh, for uh, more than 50 years. What is new is a bit uh, what I call modern machine learning. So just to, to take exactly the same picture as before, but uh, I want to stress two points. So first X, what is X? Uh, X is data and data comes from a uh, probability distribution. The every measurement that you do is actually uh, a probability distribution. So it can be uh, in any dimension as you want. So learning the data in reality means learning the probability, the underlying probability distribution behind that. So one objective of the uh, 
machine learning approach I'm going to present here is that indeed what you want to do is uh, make a model not only that is predictive, but also that can learn how to uh, what, what is really your data. And this is what is a priority distribution of your data sets. So learning Px, so the priority of X, the priority of the data can be uh, split in uh, several uh, uh, topics uh, that I will illustrate uh, in this introduction. So uh, learning the Px itself, this is called density estimation. Now, if you know uh, the priority of your data, you can compare probability. And for example, you can make a ratio of density. And this is what we do when we do classification, for instance. Uh, if, you know P if you know the Px, you can sample from it. And if you do that, then you can generate uh, data, generate model. And this is also a very strong topic in machine learning uh, nowadays. And finally, uh, if you know the uh, priority of X, but also the priority of another uh, distribution, for instance, you can do conditional uh, density estimation. And that also is very useful in a several use cases. So just to illustrate uh, these uh, four points here with uh, simple examples. So about density estimation. So what you see here is uh, the old way of doing it. So when you have your data, so the data here are the red dots. Uh, so well, this is a distribution of the data that you observe. So one thing you could do is uh, make an histogram out of it. So an histogram is already uh, an estimation of, of the density. You can do smarter things. And this is what is illustrated here. You can do a kernel density estimation that is applying a Gaussian to each of your data point. And this will result in the, in the blue curve that you see here. Uh, which is no sorry the, on the dotted uh, black curve that you see here, which resembles the true uh, underlying curve, which is in blue. So that's the idea of estimating the density of your data. Of course, this is new, and uh, this uh, kernelity density estimation method is uh, is uh, quite old. Uh, there are alternatives that uh, now are in the world of machine learning, and one of them is what we call normalizing flow. So I will just illustrate the idea, and uh, it's really not the objective to go into deep into that, but my point is to show you uh, several uh, methodologies and uh, that you uh, learn about it. And maybe if you want to study, you can look into that. So normalizing flow is assuming that your data, so this uh, sketch here can be read from the left here. So you assume that your data is generated with a Gaussian, a multidimensional Gaussian. Of course, this is not your data. Your data in general are not Gaussian, but what you can do is apply several transformations. For instance, you go from a distribution Z0 to Z1 by applying a function F1. And then you can uh, do uh, several uh, transformations like that until you reach ZK, so the last uh, bullet there, which is a factor data X. Uh, so the question that you might have is, OK, how do I do this uh, uh, move along this line by this, all these steps? What's the magic behind it. These are uh, machine learning tools, for instance, neural networks. You can train a neural network to learn the distribution of the density of your data by uh, starting from a, a, a multivariate Gaussian and learning all these steps. So this is what we call normalizing flow. And this is pretty popular now uh, in many, many applications, uh, in particular in uh, high energy physics. So if you want to know more, you can click on that link. I will. Uh, I guess you will have the slides, or I will share them with you later on. Uh, so that's give you an idea. Uh, so that was learning the density. Now, if you have density, you can uh, make ratio of them. And for instance, this is a use case of classification. And since I'm going to talk about classification later on, I can introduce one specific uh, uh, architecture of neural networks. It's called a recurrent neural network. So you have to look at this uh, diagram like that. So it starts on the lower left. These are basically the feature of your data. And you pass this feature to this, uh, as the name indicates, is a neural network which, which is recurrent. So the, the output of each network becomes the input of the next network. And uh, that's very useful, in particular, if your data comes um, in a time distribution. And uh, so by doing this recurrent step, you uh, then, then can uh, make some classification. For instance, this is used in particle physics to classify the topology of the uh, energy deposits, for instance. So that's the same idea, but now uh, applied to a, a classification. Um, something which is a fun, if you have certainly heard of it in other contexts, it is a sampling. So 
how do you generate data? So this is very popular and uh, um, this is discussed every day in the media, for instance, uh, how you can generate fake things. And you have several algorithms that can do that. Uh, one of them is a generative adversarial network, which is uh, illustrated here. So I won't go into the detail of this algorithm, but you see, so you have two neural networks. One is a, what we call a generator that produces a data and a discriminator. And the idea is that uh, this architecture will compare data that is generated with real data. So here the real data are uh, these uh, digit uh, images. And by comparing uh, data produced by the generator and the real images, you are able to uh, generate new images. So how does you uh, the generator works? It takes random noise like that. And the idea here is to um, uh, find the parameter of the model such that this kind of noise is transformed to uh, real images like that. So when this is done, you have trained your network. You just need the generator and you pass it random noise. And this will uh, provide, okay, so you have here in this example, in this example, several images of digits. So that's how uh, you generate fake images, uh, fake video and fake uh, a lot of things now can be done uh, in such a way. Uh, <clears throat> the thing is that uh, if you do that, you can generate a random, in, in this particular example, you can generate just a random uh, value. So what if you want to generate only uh, nines? Then in that case, your generative adversarial network must be conditional. And this is what we call the conditional generative adversarial network. So you have to provide it and additional information, I want only nines, and then it will uh, generate only uh, nines. So this is also an illustration of these conditional densities. So you condition uh, your data with some uh, input here, and that will uh, uh, have an impact on the, uh, the, the, the image in that case that you are going to produce. Okay, so all this is a part of the introduction of uh, this um, seminar. I show you that uh, all these algorithms, uh, these are just a few examples, but these algorithms now are applied uh, very widely in high energy physics. And I must say that at CERN, uh, there is a quite strong community that uh, not only uses this tool, but also develops them. So now it's also part of the research now done at, uh, uh, at, uh, in high energy physics. Okay, uh, so if you want to know more, you can look at that link here. Uh, there is a huge collection of references of machine learning application for high, high energy physics. So I won't go into uh, the detail, but you have several topics uh, the, uh, that are covered. But uh, if you are curious, you can uh, click on that link. You have, in fact, uh, uh, several hundreds of methodology which are proposed for a very, very large number of use cases. Okay. Um, so that's for the introduction. And now I want to uh, discuss a couple of use cases uh, related to that. The first one is this uh, internship opportunity that we, uh, we are proposing in, uh, in uh, my group on jet tagging. So first, uh, what is a jet and what is jet tagging? So here you have a, a sketch of a collision of a proton. So the two hours are the beam of proton which collide. And uh, from the collision point, you have several particles that are uh, produced. And in fact, uh, so those can be registered by uh, several uh, subsystems of the detector. The question is, uh, what what are these uh, particles? What are the what is the energy deposits that we have here, and can we do uh, physics with it? So the question that we need to uh, tackle first is, what is a jet? Uh, so we have proton-proton collision, and as you know, uh, well, you have um, uh, 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 high energy uh, processes at hand. So, for instance, uh, in that example, you have a quark gluon that are produced. So this is. Uh, uh, the process, physical process is at the partonic level, but those are not directly observable. In fact, as you know, quark and gluon uh, have to uh, uh, with, with a shower, so they, are, they will transform to hadrons in a process that we call hadronization. In fact, these quark and gluons and so on will uh, produce real particles such as pions, counts, and uh, several uh, others. So these particles are produced uh, when uh, the proton col collide. 
and then they are observable, uh, observable by the detector. So in two ways. First, if these particles are charged, so they have uh, an electric charge, then you can observe them with uh, what we call uh, the tracker. The tracker, so all uh, colliders have a tracker, so which are uh, able to, uh, to measure the passage of a charged particle. So these are called tracks. And then the particle will hit a calorimeter, either an electromagnetic calorimeter or an adrenic calorimeter, and leave uh, energy deposit. So a jet is a, a, a physics process that you observe uh, with the detector thanks to uh, the presence of tracks that you have and the energy deposits in the calorimeter. Uh, so this is what is, uh, in fact, uh, a jet. Uh, what you have below is an illustration uh, in a 2D plane. So you must see that, imagine that your um, calorimeter is uh, enrolled in a 2D plane and all these patches here correspond to energy deposit of, um, of a jet. And the Z axis is here correspond to the transverse momentum of that jet. So in fact, this is what you observe in the calorimeter. We see uh, okay, patches of uh, energy deposits and uh, like that. All right. Uh, so that seems pretty simple, but in reality, um, the, uh, the, the nature of a jet can be a bit tricky. Uh, because uh, at LHC, for instance, we produce a very high energy particle. And as illustrated here, imagine that you have a, a resonance here, such as W, Z, or Higgs boson that uh, decay. They will decay with two particles. So if the transfer momentum of this, of the let's say the W is uh, low, the two particles that come from the decay of the W uh, will, uh, will be resolved. But if the W boson has a high energy, it has a high boost, a high Lorentz boost, then the two particles will, in fact, merge into one jet. So uh, it is important to uh, understand uh, uh, when the only thing that we can observe are uh, jets, so the track and the jets. And what we want to do is uh, um, learn what was the initial particle. Was it a quark, a gluon, a resonance like that, or something else? And this is a, a very important topic at, uh, at the LHC. For instance, both Atlas and Experiment have uh, programs uh, that look into that because understanding the, the physics underlying here, so what, uh, where does this jet come from, is a way to uh, know if uh, the, the physics that you are looking at is a standard or not. And uh, th th that's the last line here. For the search for the beyond the standard model of physics, it is uh, very important to know the nature of the jets and uh, yeah, to, to go back to the initial particle that produces this. So how do you do that? Uh, well, so here you have uh, some images of uh, decay of particles. So in all these images, you have, uh, for instance, this is a Higgs boson decaying to a pair of B quarks. So B quark will hadronize into B hadrons and then uh, hit the calorimeter. And what you see here are, is an example of energy deposit of such a process. And if you look at uh, all these uh, lines uh, here, you see that uh, the energy deposit depends really on the underlying physics. For instance, for gluons, you have, uh, okay, the, the jets are much less resolved. They are much more spread. While here you have uh, Higgs decaying to four quarks and the, uh, yeah. The image is different. So uh, what we call tagging or jet tagging is understanding from um, these images. Uh, so this is, in fact, uh, very similar to image recognition. So from these images, we want to uh, go back to the initial process. So this is what we call jet tagging. And, and as you can imagine, uh, uh, you can use, use a lot of tools to do that. And in particular, uh, machine learning tools that are uh, quite common in uh, image recognition can be used. So, um, yeah, so that's uh, okay, the same sketch as before. So, imagine you have your two your protons that collide, and uh, here are your jets. Here is the image of the energy deposit of your jets. And the question is uh, what particle? Uh, is this? Is it a Higgs, a W, a Z boson, a top quark, or uh, anything else? 
So, and that's the idea between the jet tagging. So, uh, recognize this image and try to associate it to classify. This is a classification problem to classify this image to a given process. Okay. Uh, so, there are several methods to do that. So, you can start simple. So starting simple means uh, doing uh, a simple neural network. So in that case, it would be a multi-class neural network. Uh, so here you have a sketch of a neural network. So uh, you, you read it from the left to the right. So on the left, these are the variables that you have. So that could be anything. In fact, it could be uh, the uh, uh, really the image. So uh, the value of each pixel or the energy deposited in each pixel of that image. So that could be the, the input of your uh, data, for instance. Oh, sorry, the input for your neural network. In that case, illustrated here, these are um, variable. So maybe it's a bit too small here, but uh, in fact, instead of taking the full image like that, you can calculate several quantities that we call jet substructure. So these are... Uh, physical quantities that you can attach to all these energy deposits. And this is what you see in these inputs. So you have uh, well several uh, quantities that can be uh, theoretically uh, calculated. They are motivated uh, by the theory and they are be, then be calculated experimentally. And this is uh, what is uh, shown here. So you have all these quantities and this is your input for each energy deposit. Then you have uh, all these inputs. And the output, you have the classification. Uh, so what is the nature of the, that uh, physics process, X, Z, W, boson, top quark, or uh, other things. Okay, so that's pretty standard. Uh, so we are building a neural network. So this is uh, now uh, very common nowadays. And uh, um, a neural network that predicts uh, so, uh, the, the potential class of your physics process. Uh, okay, so in fact, in this uh, internship, uh, and this is also the, the work of a PhD student uh, here, uh, we, we start exactly by that. But now there are many other algorithms that I don't have time to go through them that can um, uh, be applied, which are much more advanced. So I will just show you one, which is maybe the most advanced thing that is on the market now. Uh, so this is uh, the newest or maybe almost the newest state of the art architecture that you can use to do this job. And uh, uh, the name of it is uh, a transformer, a transformer which rely on what we call the attention mechanism. So I will not describe that here. Uh, so if you are interested or curious, you can look at the, the paper here that describes exactly how this architecture could be, can be implemented in the, for this particular uh, objective of jet tagging. Uh, I just want to say something about it. So this structure is, um, well, one of the most complex things that you can actually do now in machine learning. Um, and if you don't know it, you might have used it when you, if you ever tried ChatGPT or all uh, natural, language natural language processing uh, uh, tools, uh, they rely on what we call transformers. So when you, uh, or even uh, in your smartphone, if you try to write a text, it will predict the next word you want to write. So this is based on transformer technology. So this is very, very common. It came from a natural language processes, but now it's also applied in energy physics. Okay, so that's probably the most complex thing that you, you could do. Uh, I'm not saying that we are going to do that, but that's one of the uh, possible algorithms that, uh, that, that, that can be applied to that task. And in fact, there are, in this paper that I mentioned here, there's a proof of concept which shows uh, groundbreaking performances. So that is the identification, identification of these jets is uh, really improved by applying such a very, very advanced algorithm. Okay, so, and this is uh, very different from that. So the neural networks are around since the 1950, while these things is uh, very, very recent. Okay, um, so that's, uh, yeah, maybe I I can make a, a brief pause here. So I've covered this uh, jet tagging um, part, and now I'll move to uh, a slightly different topic, but the idea is, Again, to show you uh, the, the research potential that you can have behind uh, with these, using these tools. 
And I will move to a concrete, uh, concrete uh, uh, example of search for new physics. OK, so let me move to this uh, other uh, research application. So search for new physics. So uh, well, this small map here illustrates the idea. So we have the standard model of particle physics. So this is a very well established theory that is around since the 70s. Uh, and uh, as you might know, it has been tested in a very, very high precision. In fact, the standard body is rock solid, and uh, it's even a problem in the sense that we are we know that the standard body is not complete. We should have uh, it should be part of a, a more general theory, but so far uh, we haven't seen any hint of uh, new physics. So the new physics is uh, everything that is not uh, predicted by uh, the standard model. And uh, yeah, so the, the question is why haven't we seen anything new with respect to the, the standard model? Maybe uh, there is no new physics at the uh, scale of the LHC, that's a possibility. Or maybe, and that's uh, the, the, the idea I want to explore here, uh, maybe uh, we haven't looked uh, in the best possible way uh, for a new phenomena. Uh, so my uh, the plan here is really to show uh, maybe these alternative approaches that could uncover a uh, new uh, unknown uh, physics uh, phenomenon. Okay, so uh, at LHC, uh, we in general perform what we call direct searches. So direct search means that we are looking at several signatures. So a signature is uh, something that you observe in the detector. And from that, we try to connect this signature with either a certain model or new uh, uh, theories. So what you see here is a, a, well, a, a sketch of some possible extension of the standard model. I will not discuss those. But the idea is that, uh, so on the left, you have the uh, uh, potential extension of standard model. On the right, you have uh, the signature. So those things are, that can be observed in a detector. And uh, you see that from a given signature, for instance, that one, you can connect to uh, uh, one or several uh, theories. Uh, so that's what has been done at LHC and uh, to other colliders before uh, the LHC. Uh, so this is a standard job uh, for people who are doing uh, searches for new physics um, at CERN, for instance. Uh, the, the problem is uh, that to cover uh, the widest range of potential uh, new physics scenario, you should cover as many signatures as possible. And that's not possible. You cannot cover all signatures. Uh, at least it is very difficult because uh, yeah, you have to, uh, for, for time constraints, it's in general not possible to cover all possible signatures. So maybe that's one of the reasons why we haven't seen anything new up to now. OK, so how do you uh, search for a new uh, phenomenon? So a standard approach, which has uh, been done for decades, is look for bump of a, a distribution. This is what is illustrated on the plot on the left. So imagine that your model, let's say the standard model predicts uh, a distribution uh, that is uh, shown by the red dotted line. But you look at your data, you see a deviation with respect to your prediction. Well, this is a new phenomena that you observe. So an illustration uh, is uh, given on the plot on the right. So you see uh, the data points. So these are the number of events as a function of the invariant mass. Uh, you see the data point in black, and in red, you have a simulation of the background. And in fact, uh, this plot, maybe you have seen it uh, before. This is uh, one of the plots that uh, uh, showed the Higgs discovery. So here, the Higgs boson decays to a pair of Z, and each Z decays to two leptons. So what you are looking at are, are four leptons. So this is a new, not new physics, because we know that a uh, Higgs boson is part of the standard model. but just to illustrate the idea. So imagine that you have a simulation that produce, predicts all the processes that you know, so this background event, and then you see a bump. Well, this is something new. The problem of that is that uh, all this procedure, it has been done for decades again. Uh, it is very uh, effective, uh, but you cannot cover all possible signatures, all possible channels. And also, it relies uh, on uh, Monte Carlo simulations. So what you see here in uh, these colors, so the red and the purple, these are Monte Carlo simulations. Monte Carlo simulations are very, very precise. 
but they take a very long time to uh, to, to to be done and they uh, take also a huge amount of resources of uh, computing resources so doing this simulation is possible but it's uh, very time consuming and you cannot do that for all possible simulations so uh, this means that we need to do something so here i wrote a small uh, christmas wish list of what we could do as an alternative uh, strategy to search for uh, this new physics so here we are going to search for what we call anomalies so anomalies, as the name indicates, is anything that is different from uh, what you could expect. So how do you search for anomalies? Well, you want to search for an unknown signal. Uh, ideally, you would like to uh, uh, construct your background model directly from the data. So that is not relying on a time-consuming Monte Carlo simulation. Then you want to build uh, an algorithm uh, which uh, will be able to uh, spot a potential signal in your data. And finally, uh, you want to apply this to uh, one signature, but uh, maybe also many different type of signatures. Okay, So the, uh, the, the general idea that we have here. Uh, so there are several uh, approaches that uh, propose uh, that. And what I'm going to show you here is, a, 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 in fact, a, a paper that we published this year. Uh, so one of the principal author is a PhD student that we had in our team. And uh, this is a, what we call a proof of concept. Uh, so an algorithm that shows that what uh, I've show, uh, described in this uh, uh, wish list is indeed possible. Okay, so here is the methodology. So I will not uh, go too much into the details, uh, but if you are curious, you can look into this uh, paper where all the, this is explained. Uh, so the idea is uh, we constructed uh, a machine learning uh, algorithm that we call the GAN AI. So GAN is a generative network, and AI it stands for autoencoder. So uh, very briefly, the, the algorithm does the following. So it takes original data, it passes through the autoencoder, and the autoencoder is a, a common uh, method to um, to reconstruct the data. So the data enters the autoencoder, and then is the same data uh, is go out from this uh, tool. But in addition, uh, this autoencoder calculates what we call an anomaly score. So it will tell you how anomalous is your data that is uh, it sees. So, uh, so for uh, yeah, standard data, classical data, it will, be, uh, it will be calculate a low anomaly score. But if this autoencoder sees something new, it will uh, say, it will trigger it and say, okay, this has a very high anomaly score. And uh, here, the discriminant will try to uh, differentiate between original events and events which have been passed through this autoencoder. So the idea, so this is a rather original approach that was proposed here. And the idea is to add this discriminant to force uh, the autoencoder to be able to calculate the best anomaly score uh, possible. So, uh, the, 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 so the thing that you need to, uh, to, to understand in that slide, slide is that this architecture in the end calculates an anomaly score. Uh, so this is what is represented here. So you have an anomaly score for all the events that the algorithm sees. And what we expect, so we are going to apply a cut on this anomaly score. So for instance, here, we just select the 1% events in the tail. And uh, what we expect is that uh, if there is signal in our data, it will fall on the tail of the anomaly score. So a very anomalous event will be there. Okay, so by applying this algorithm, you can calculate this, this score and then selecting a subsample of uh, your data, which could be potentially uh, rich in uh, signal events. Okay, so that's the general idea. Um, so, Another illustration is, uh, so for that, we, we are going to consider uh, a one-dimensional distribution. So let's take the invariant mass of a system. So you have your data. You can calculate the mass of your system. And this is what is represented here. So uh, as a function of the invariant mass, you have the number of events in each uh, bins. And uh, OK, so that's basically, imagine uh, this is your data, right? Uh, so if you have a signal there, uh, in general, it, it should be rare. This means that you won't see it here. You won't see a bump. So in, uh, not in that case, you will clearly see a bump. 
But in the, since we haven't seen anything at the LHC up to now, this means that if there is new physics, it is very, very rare. So this means that if you look at your data, you won't see a bump appearing here. So we need to apply something such as to make the bump appear. So as I said, uh, you can pass all your data through uh, your algorithm and calculate an anomaly score. And then you will just select a small percentage of events that pass a threshold that you apply here. So if you do that, you take your data, you pass uh, the anomaly score selection, you have that. Okay, so is there any signal hidden there? How can you know? Well, you can't because this is your data that pass this threshold, but to know if there is a signal, you have to compare uh, this to a background model and you don't have it here. So one idea is to just take the original distribution shape, shape that you have here and say, this is our background model. So the idea is that. So you take the shape of your distribution here and you have plug it on your uh, uh, selected data set and that's your background model. And in that case, you would see that indeed you have an excess compared to your background. Okay, so that's the method that uh, we put into place. Uh, of course, uh, you, one objection you might have is, okay, there is no reason that the background shape here can be applied there. Indeed, this is a valid uh, uh, objection. And the algorithm we uh, developed was indeed um, able to tackle that problem and make uh, sure that uh, that was possible. So indeed, the distribution of the background in the total data could be applied even if we select a subsample of the data which uh, potentially reach of signal. Okay, uh, so just go to a bit uh, more uh, into this idea. In general, this doesn't work. So if you have your data set like that, and you apply a threshold on the anomaly score, well, you will see that your uh, data distribution, the background distribution will be uh, distorted. So this is a blue distribution I've shown before. If you don't apply any selection on the anomaly score, but if you apply a selection, for example, at the 50 percentile or 85 percentile, you see this will um, change the shape of your background projection. So in general, the, the strategy that I've highlighted here doesn't work. So we had to uh, put some uh, uh, additional constraints into algorithms to make it work in the end. Uh, okay, so uh, maybe I should move a little bit uh, faster. So again, I don't want to bother you with a very uh, uh, gory detail, but this is how we train the algorithm. So there are two parts. There is one, which is a discriminant, which uh, job is to learn if it sees original or uh, data coming from the other coder. And this is a very classical uh, classification problem, which rely on the, what we call the binary cross entropy. And then you have the auto encoder, which is an important part for the uh, calculation of anomaly score. Also there, uh, this is rather classical, but if you do that, it will not work. So you will have uh, the issue that we saw here, so that uh, the auto encoder will transform the shape of the background and it will not be usable anymore. So to cope for that, we had to apply some uh, new ideas. So we, uh, without uh, going into detail, we applied two things. Basically, we reweighted the, the distribution of your data, and we applied some algorithm that we call DISCO uh, that allows to decorrelate uh, between the anomaly score the, that the autoencoder calculates and the uh, spectrum of the data. And that indeed works. Uh, so maybe I should, uh, uh, sorry, yeah. Uh, this, if you do that, you indeed show that uh, the distribution of your background is not affected by applying the selection on the anomaly score. So it, it stays stable, stable. So this show that indeed we are able to uh, use uh, the original shape of your background distribution into uh, our uh, in this sample that we select. Okay, so that works. Now we want to apply this onto uh, some data. So for this, uh, fortunately, we had uh, there is a challenge that was done in uh, 2020 that is called the LHC Olympics. The idea is to uh, so the organizer of this challenge provided a very large data set that is composed on uh, R&D data, which was used to train the algorithm. 
so in that data set, you have uh, some background uh, samples, so it's uh, actually multi-jet uh, QCD events, and two signals to play with. So the signal, for instance, one of them is shown here, is a new physics signal, so you have a Z prime of 3.5 TV that decays into two particles, that decay uh, each of them to two particles. So this is just to, uh, okay, to train uh, the, um, the methodology. And then what was more interesting is that uh, the uh, organizer of this uh, challenge provides some uh, black box data sets. So these are data sets where you don't know what is in there. So you know for sure that there is some background, but you don't know whether uh, there is signal or not in that. So this is, uh, once you have tested your method on that, you can, uh, we, we tried and we applied our methodology to see if you were able to find the signal, okay? Uh, maybe this I can skip, but just that you know, uh, so the data set is comprised of uh, um, each event is composed of 704 vectors that are, then you use those to calculate uh, several number of uh, uh, features. So in our case, we took uh, 42 features for each event. So these are the variables that we do feed to our uh, algorithm. Okay. Uh, so that's a classical way of uh, checking the performance of the algorithm. So this is uh, again in this uh, R&D uh, data set. Uh, we saw, so this showed uh, uh, the anomaly score calculated by the algorithm. So in blue, is, this is a background. And in uh, yellow here, you see the signal. So it shows indeed that that particular signal will appear at a high value of the anomaly score. Exactly this is what we want. So to quantify the, uh, the performance of the algorithm, you can look at the rock curve. And so the, uh, let's just look at these values. The higher the value, the best it is. So that seems reasonable to us. And we were uh, confident enough that the methodology could be applied to these black boxes, right? Uh, okay, this I can skip. Uh, <clears throat> so now, once we have assessed our strategy, we could apply it to the, to the black box. And this is uh, the result that we got. So uh, I will just show the result on black box one. Uh, right. So we uh, pass the data into our algorithm. We uh, calculate an anomaly score, and we just select 1% of the data that pass a threshold on this anomaly score. If you do that, you have the data points are in blue. Right. Uh, and then you want to compare that to uh, background distribution. But in the background distribution, in our case, we know what it is because this is just a distribution of the data prior to a duplication of a particular cut. And this is what we do. So we superimpose the uh, background distribution with the data, and we apply that to an algorithm which is called bind parameter, which in fact that student uh, actually also developed. And the bump parameter, as the name indicates, it will look for bumps so it will compare the data to a uh, reference background and look for uh, any bump. So this algorithm indeed finds a region where there is a excess of the data compared to this uh, background modeling, which is also shown here. So here you have the significance as a function of urine mass. So you see that there is an excess here. So indeed, uh, the method seems to find an excess. There is a bump found around 4 TV. Uh, okay. The question is, is that bump true? Uh, how can we know? So indeed, as that was a challenge, the organizer released the true information and we could compare uh, what we got with uh, the true uh, signal that was indeed injected. And this is what you see on the plot on the left, uh, right, sorry. You have your, uh, so the, the color, the histogram are correspond to the true uh, value of the signal, so blue, is a true background and the uh, orange, this is a thing that was injected. So we saw, you see that uh, indeed, the excess that we have highlighted that is here also, correspond to a signal that is indeed observed in our methodology. So this means that, uh, and the signal was pretty rare. It, we, we had only 830 events over 1 million. So uh, indeed, uh, and that correspond to a Z prime signal of 3.8 TV. And uh, okay, so in conclusion, uh, we have developed this methodology in a use case. Again, these are not real ATAS data. This is a, uh, yeah, uh, these are toy data set which are done very precisely, but still these are not real data. Okay, so what we could show is that indeed our methodology was able to find the signal. So indeed, 
it spots a signal because it's able to isolate a region of the data which is rich of signal, and it's also able to predict the background modeling directly from the data. Uh, by applying a cut on the on our anomaly score, we are able to increase the signal over background ratio over factor 20. And that's what allows us to, uh, from 0.8% to move to uh, almost uh, uh, yeah 15% uh, signal efficiency. Okay, so that's uh, what I wanted to tell you here. So uh, this is an idea, it's not the only one, others have done uh, also a very uh, good uh, uh, approaches, uh, but this is typically what we call a proof of concept in a, a rather complex uh, scenario. We are we can show indeed that we are able to uh, find a potential signal. So what is next? Of course, uh, and that's uh, the objective of the next thesis uh, that uh, started this year is to apply this uh, onto Atlas data. Okay, so now uh, this brings me to the conclusion. So I try to convince you here with the introduction also uh, with two uh, very specific uh, specific examples that uh, machine learning, or let's call it a modern machine learning, is not doing what we do before. It's really doing things more quickly and doing uh, also physics that was not possible, uh, that would be not possible otherwise. And all these methodology rely on a very smart uh, idea. As most of them are quite recent on uh, how to treat uh, the data now. Uh, this is, a, in fact, a huge potential in the phys new physics searches, or in general, so physics searches or physics measurement at LHC. And this is already uh, being done in uh, most of the uh, research area in high energy physics. Uh, indeed, this uh, uh, also a very active field. Uh, and uh, yeah. so maybe my last word, um, that's quite exciting. And um, this provides uh, many also opportunities for a young physicists, for you, uh, basically. Why is that interesting? Because you will, if you like uh, coding, uh, but also statistics and learning these um, uh, novel machine learning approaches. Uh, uh, and these are really uh, things which are developed. Uh, I'm not saying that every day uh, people come up with a new idea, but uh, uh, this is a really a field where uh, progress uh, is a uh, kind of exponential. And what's interesting for us, physicists, that in the end, we do apply that into our physics uh, topics with a, a groundbreaking uh, performance. So that's, I think, is uh, quite exciting. Okay, uh, so thanks for uh, listening to me. And uh, of course, I will be very happy to answer your questions.